Romans chapter 12, verse 1, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Do not be pressed into the mold of this world. There is the idea of this world and the world to come, this age and the age to come. The idea of those things that are opposed to God. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he didn't use this world, but he used this idea. What do we pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he calls us to pray. Why does he call us to pray that? Because this world is opposed to him and opposed to his will. This is important to understand. It's all we know. It's what we're born into and it's all we know. So when you are apart from Christ, again, it's not just that you have bad habits. You're part of a world. You're part of a system that is opposed to God at every turn. However, it is subtle in that this world doesn't show open opposition to God. That would be too obvious. Instead, there are these subtle adjustments here and there. And next there is the idea of the devil. Not only are we in this world, not only are we in this system that is opposed to God, not only are we fully pressed into the mold of this system that is fully opposed to God, but there is also this influence following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So first of all, there is this system that is set up, this, this world to which we belong, these lenses over our eyes, this picture of reality that's painted for us, these things that are assumed because they are all we've ever known. And in addition to those things, as, as if that were not enough, there is actually the devil. There is actually evil spiritual forces there is actually a demonic world, a demonic realm, and we can get in trouble in two ways here. There's a ditch on both sides of the road. We can overestimate the influence of the devil, or we can underestimate the influence of the devil. The fact of the matter is, the scripture's clear. We were under his influence. So we have this world, this system, that is teaching us what to believe and what to think, what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. And then we have the spiritual reality of the devil himself, the spiritual reality of demonic forces, this spiritual reality that is influencing us and that is actively working against us, that is actively working to keep us blind, actively working to keep us satisfied with the world and not aware of or desiring anything other than that. Lest you think you're just innocent in all this, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There's two important things here. He brings this full circle when he refers to the rest of mankind. He's making a point there. The point there goes back to the world. And it is not as though the world is just sort of here in pockets here and there. It's the rest of mankind. And the people who are not under this influence are in the minority. There is a broad gate and there is a narrow gate. But before he says this, he makes reference to our flesh, to our own desires, to our bodies and our minds and what our bodies and our minds want. So here is why the world and the devil are so powerful, because they give us exactly what we want. That's who we are. We're not individuals who would otherwise pursue God if the devil would just leave us alone. Far from it, since the fall, with the first Adam as our federal head, we are averse to all good things. Listen to the way the confessions put it, both Westminster and London. From this original corruption whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposed to all good and wholly inclined to all evil do proceed all actual transgressions. Our sins come from our sin nature. It's who we are. It's what we want. It's what we desire. So don't think of it as though we, we come into this world and we're innocent and we're really looking for a way to find God and a way to please God, but all of a sudden this world says, no, don't do that. And the devil says, no, don't do that. Actually, no, that's not radical enough. That's not sinful enough. That's not who you were. Here's who you were before you came to Christ. You came with fleshly desires that were against God. You came with desires of your body and your mind that were alienated to God. You came with desires that were evil, and the devil and the world did not have to seek you out. You rested in them because they gave you exactly what you wanted. The devil knows your name and you know his voice. You were convinced that he loved you as much as you loved him. The 
the world was a comfortable place to you. It was all that you wanted, and that is because your very nature craved it. This is why the doctrine of original sin is so important. If we don't understand the doctrine of original sin, then we don't get this. We don't understand the, we don't understand the sinfulness of our sin because somehow we think that we're innocent and our environment just somehow made us go all wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. We are sinners. That, that's why we stand up at funerals and say that people who never wanted to be with God on this earth are in a better place spending eternity with the one that they didn't want to be with here. Because we don't get this. We don't understand this. And because we don't understand this, we don't understand how desperate we are for a radical redemption. I, actually, because we don't understand this, we don't think we need to be saved. We actually just think we need to be helped. We don't think we need good news. We think we need good advice. We don't need the gospel. We just need 10 ways to have a happy life and five ways to reduce stress because that's our problem. We don't believe this. And this is why we say, we, we hear preachers say it all the time. There's a guy down my way, down in Houston, smiling Joel. Smiling Joel says, sinners don't need to be told they're sinners. They know they're sinners. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They look at the guy on the news who hacks somebody up and they say, that's a sinner, not me. They don't sin, they make mistakes. You sin, but they don't. They make bad choices. They have bad patches. They have bad habits, but they're not sinners. They're not individuals who pursue their own fleshly desires at the expense of everyone and anything else, unless they can be helped in their fleshly desires. They're not sinners who are under the influence of this world because this world is giving them exactly what they want, which is not God. They're not sinners who are under the influence of the prince of the power of the air because they love the prince of the power of the air. They're just people who sometimes make mistakes. The Bible says that they're children of wrath, and so are we. If you understand that you're a child of wrath, you understand that you don't need good advice. You need good news there is no good news in this. This is all bad. There's no hope whatsoever. I'm dead and I'm under the influence of this world that opposes God and the prince of the power of the air who opposes God. And what's worse, my flesh, my body, my mind, they like it and they want it and they don't want God. And I'm an enemy of God and I deserve God's wrath. By the way, here's a footnote. In case you were wondering, there's so many people miss this one. I love to ask people, you know, even if you know you, you need to be saved, do you know what you need to be saved from? You need to be saved from the wrath of God, this holy and righteous and just God. That's why we find verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace we've been saved. There's no room there. There's nothing there. There's nothing God saw in you. It's just not there. There's nothing in you that rose up above the rest. It's just not there. The answer is, but God, you're dead. I don't care how many times you've heard the illustration. You're sinking, you're drowning, you're about to go down for the last time, and God throws you the life preserver, but you gotta grab it. Dead men don't grab. You're a rotting corpse. You are not almost dead. You are not nearly dead. You're dead, which means that the only hope is the grace of God. But watch what happens. You were dead and now you get life. God made us alive together with Christ. You, you, you were dead, but now you're alive together with Christ. This is important. This is the doctrine of regeneration. This is God making us alive. This is God making us born again. And no matter how many, how many times we hear out there in popular evangelicalism that we sort of born ourselves again, you can no more born yourself again than you born yourself the first time. Being born again is an act of God. Being born again is a supernatural act. Being born again is something that you don't ask for, you don't have sense enough to ask for, you're dead. God does this, and it's by his grace that he does this, and it's for his glory that he does this. It's because of Christ that he does this, and it's by grace alone. We don't like this. We do not understand that we're hemmed in on every side. We do not understand that our nature is averse to God. We do not understand that the world and the devil are partnering with us as we willingly pursue them as opposed to God. We don't get that. We think that somehow we just need a little help from dead to alive, from the course of this world to heavenly places. Verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is important throughout Ephesians. 
in chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verses 20 and 21. He raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named. Chapter 3, verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. He has blessed us in the heavenly places. He has seated us in the heavenly places. Christ rules and reigns in the heavenly places. The church brings glory and manifests God's glory in the heavenly places. So who among us thinks that Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 is designed to make us fear the heavenly places? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's interesting. We're wrestling against spiritual forces that are in the heavenly places. Somebody else is in the heavenly places. Christ. That's where he is. That's where he rules and reigns. That's where we are seated with him. That's where the church brings him glory. Chapter 6 is not written to make us fear the devil, but to give us faith because of the one who rules and reigns in that realm from dead to alive, from the course of this world to heavenly places, from the prince of the power of the air to the prince of peace. How many times have we read in Christ, with Christ? We are in Christ. We are in him and he is in us. No longer under the rule of the prince of the power of the air, but under the rule of the prince of peace. From gratifying our own desires to bringing glory to God. Look at verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that's this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice that there is a complete reversal of our previous condition. We were dead, now we're alive in Christ. We were following the pattern of this world, now we're seated in the heavenly places with Christ. We were under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, but now we are in Christ. We were gratifying our desires, the desires of our body, the desires of our minds, and yet now we have been recreated. We are God's workmanship, and there is work that God has for us to do that brings Him glory in the heavenly places. Now we understand the nature of our salvation. It's only when we understand the radical nature of our depravity. You understand the radical nature of your depravity, you understand your need for salvation. You understand the radical nature of your depravity. You understand what has to be the mechanism for your salvation. God's got to do that. You can't do that. You understand the radical nature of your depravity. You understand the magnitude of your salvation. You understand what you've been saved from. And it also gives you a picture of the magnitude and the glory of Christ, who is the one whose person and work has purchased us for God. And you also understand the need for us to preach the gospel. People don't need good advice. You need good news. You didn't need good advice. You needed good news. Yeah, but what about the rest of that stuff? It covers it in the last three chapters. We get this incredibly practical application of the truths in the first three chapters, all throughout the second half. And it's so that we understand one thing, that in Christ we have all that we need. And yet, in chapter six, we come back to the infamous spiritual warfare passage. Why? I was dead, and I was living according to the pattern of this world. I was under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, and I loved it. I loved it because it was right in line with what my flesh desired, with what my body desired, with what my mind desired. It was all I knew. I was completely wrapped up in it. In fact, when I heard about Christianity, one of the responses to Christianity, and this is all of us, how do people respond to Christianity? You hear about Christianity and you chafe against the idea of rules. You chafe, you chafe against the idea of your fun and your freedom being taken away. But why do you think we do that? Because that's what the world and the prince of the power of the air says to you. The prince of the power of the air says, hey, your flesh is really satisfied right now. Actually, it's not, which is why you got to continue to pursue more and more and more and more and more. But that's a whole other sermon. But your flesh is satisfied right now. You get to go pursue what you want, when you want, the way you want it. That stuff over there, they're telling you you can't have that anymore. You don't want that. And your flesh is going, yeah, that's bad. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. He opens our eyes and we see ourselves and we see the world, and we see the devil. We recognize the fact that we are enemies of God and objects of his wrath and he saves us and it is glorious and we're grateful and this is still all we know. 
which is why we need those ordinary means of grace, which is why we need the body of Christ. Let me ask you something. The question came earlier. The person who says, I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church. Here's what that person is saying. That person is saying, I've lived in this world. My flesh has de delighted in this world. I've been under the prince of the power of the air. I, I love him and I believe that he loved me. And it was the only thing that I knew and I pursued it with every fiber of my being. Now my eyes have been opened and I see this and I'm saved and I'm grateful, but I'll be okay staying right here among the rest of those who are objects of wrath. I don't need to be conformed or be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'll just stay here and continue to be conformed to this pattern and I'll be okay. Or if I don't think I'll be okay, I think I can in and of myself with a mind that has been completely warped for my entire life, figure out how to be more like Christ all by myself right here in the same place where he found me. Folks, as we say where I come from, that dog won't hunt. This is why we have desperate need of the ordinary means of grace. This is why we need to read the scriptures. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know how messed up you are. You really don't. And I have people who ask me sometimes, you know, they ask me, you know, how, you, know you, 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 you know, the way you grew up and where you grew up and what you experienced and what you went through and, and, and you turned out okay. You know what? First of all, I'm not okay. Secondly, if you think I am, it's because you're not okay. I am reminded every day of how much I need to be transformed by the renewing of my life. Every day. You know what I love? I love old, bent over, slow walking, gray headed, walking with Jesus for a long time saints who look at you in their own way and smile and tell you about what they just learned. That just blesses me. I look at a person who's 80, 85, 90 years old and they're still learning. God is still opening up his truth to them. And I look from this side and say, if you realize how much more there is to gain, which means I'm not there. Because if I'm not careful, I can still be comfortable in the world. If I'm not careful, I can still run and gratify my flesh. If I'm not careful, I, I still can have an ear tuned to the prince of the power of the air. If I'm not vigilant, I love those ordinary means of grace. Prayer, scriptures, preaching of the word, ordinances, fellowship with the saints, singing those great songs of faith and having them ring in my ears and remind me again and again and again of those things that I am so apt to forget. You see, understanding this radical depravity of ours not only gives us a sensitivity toward those who are lost, not only helps us to understand the magnitude of our salvation, but it also reminds us that we're still in desperate need because the world and the flesh and the devil are still there being mortified. Amen? We still have this treasure in our vessels. We still have weaknesses. We still need to be vigilant. And we still need to be wary of the world, the flesh, and the devil. But never afraid. Why? Because I'm not dead anymore. I'm alive. Not afraid. Why? Because I belong to the Prince of Peace and not to the Prince of the Power of the Air. I'm not afraid. Why? Because he's in my, even my flesh is being redeemed. Not there yet. Better today than yesterday. It's better tomorrow than today by God's grace and with his help. Let's pray. Confess to you our great need because of the world and the flesh and the devil that we war constantly. We confess to you that we still remember the pattern, that we still remember the voice, and that we still struggle with the desires. And yet we confess to you that we know that that is not who we are because we've been made alive together with Christ, because we've been seated with him in the heavenly places, because our allegiance has changed from the prince of the power of the air to the prince of peace and because our bodies are now temples of the Holy Spirit. Grant by your grace that Christ would be formed in us. Grant by your grace that the work of sanctification would continue in us. Grant by your grace that the desire for the things of God would increase in us. Grant by your grace that our disdain for sin, our disdain for the world, our disdain for the prince of the power of the air, our disdain for our own sinful fleshly desires would increase in us, that our sin would be mortified and that Christ would be glorified. And that as a result, we would worship him. And that as a result, we would speak of him. For how dare we be freed from such an awful condition and leave others to linger therein. This is our prayer. This is the earnest desire of our soul. And we ask it because we believe it's in accordance with the will and the nature and the authority of Jesus, who is the Christ, our Lord, Master, Savior, Redeemer, 
and friend.